I will start uh, by giving, I guess, a little bit of a background into who we are. Um, Slavs and Tatars is arts collective that was founded in 2006 as a, as a reading group, essentially, uh, informal reading group. And we, we have three kinds of activities, exhibition making, which you traditionally call art, let's say with a capital A, um, exhibitions meaning installations, artwork, sculptures, audio works, um, publications is another kind of access of our work, an important access of our work, um, and um, lecture performances. So let me start a little bit with our publications because um, we have published about 10 books so far, a little bit more, I think. Uh, these are a selection of our books, uh, I think, to date. Uh, what's important about these books and distinguishes them from, let's say, normal publications by artists is that they are not catalogs. They, you will not find anything about us, nobody writing about us in these books. Now, normally, let's say how the tonight's talk or presentation, I want to just maybe give you a, 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 a take a step back and say that there's, there will be kind of two parallel tracks I'll be speaking about and kind of two voices, a kind of a, 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 a doppelganger voice, as the Germans would say, a doubled voice of a um, a double consciousness, you could say, even in some sense, to, to take a W.E.B. Du Bois's race theory. Um, one voice is a, a kind of, let's say, a traditional artist voice, a more romantic, sentimental approach, let's say, a more affective approach to uh, the subject matter. But there's also a, a more practical, I don't want to say cynical, but let's say more kind of hard facts, uh, socioeconomic approach. Now, the socioeconomic explanation for why we publish books or why these books are different is that most of the time when you're invited to do an exhibition as an artist, if it's a solo exhibition, there is usually a small budget left aside for a publication. And an institution will say to you, okay, well, this is a pub this is your, let's say 10% of your total budget is for a publication or 15%. Who would you like to invite to write about you? And we refuse this first gesture because we find it to be a kind of uh, equal to sort of equi equivalent to insider trading that you find in like the stock markets when people have inside information and they're making trades. It's, um, it's because essentially if I invite somebody to write about us, uh, they will not be objective. And it's a kind of patting each other on our backs. It's kind of, a, it's a form of, of corruption to be perfectly honest uh, in the art world. It's considered normal in the art world. Um, so we don't allow this, uh, we believe, and also by doing that, we've created a kind of firewall where we, where by extension, uh, the press is, we believe that if the press wants to write about us, a critic wants to write about us, they should have the, it should be in their own platform of or their own media platform or their own media organ. And thus they can be more objective, uh, be more uh, critical. And it's, I have to say it's, it's worked quite well because uh, for example, I can give you is that I, I bet you we're the only artist, at least of our generation of the past 20 years, who has a eight page negative uh, review in a magazine. Normally artists don't get negative reviews anymore. If they do, they're not eight pages long because uh, there's a kind of uh, uh, an unspoken rule in the art world or in the culture industry, which is that if you don't like something, you don't write about it. Well, somebody clearly didn't like us enough to write eight pages. Uh, about it, uh, and it was difficult, of course, the first time to read this. But in the end, it was very important because it's it's this kind of that's a kind of robust criticism that's necessary for a healthy art and uh, artistic ecosystem. Um, if we don't have this kind of, if we're only getting profile pieces or people asking who we are or, or praising, then it's it's it, then it's not a dialogue. It's essentially a kind of echo chamber. Anyway, these books are the books that we've done over the past ten years. Tonight, I'll be talking about two in particular. Um, this one, which is uh, you might be familiar with, two cycles of work called Polish Shiite Showbiz. Um, now, as I mentioned, these books are not catalogs because catalogs are documentations of something which has already happened. And our books actually precede the artworks. So they're in some sense, a kind of a guide, like, like an, almost like a, a manual uh, of what is going to come in the future. And they, of course, present our research. So the book here uh, is called <laughs> all about the letter H. Uh, there's one book called Nisvorni Nasuvki about the nasal sounds in Polish and Turkic languages, the Ao and Ao in Polish, the N in the Turkish. This one is about the relationship between Poland and Iran, which I'll talk about uh, shortly. And the most recent one is this one here called Ripped Script, 
about language politics in, uh, in our region and alphabet politics in particular. Now, um, as I mentioned, there's a, the way we work is we have cycles of research. So we are uh, uh, one of the, you, you might've heard of this kind of type of artist, kind of a research-based artist, meaning that uh, we spend several years doing research. Now today, this term is used so often um, I would say most artists of our milieu call themselves research-based artists. Uh, to be honest, I, I, I have a little bit of an issue with that because I don't believe research means you go somewhere where you have an exhibition for one week or two weeks or one month. For me, research is really old school, meaning you're doing scholarly research. So we spent two, basically two years doing what is uh, bibliographic research, like a PhD student or like a scholar, professor. Uh, we read this material and then we, the hardest part is, is digesting it and translating it into art. Really, what does it, what is of this research? Why are we as artists working with this? What are we bringing to the table? So here you can see our eight cycles of research so far. Some of these cycles have books related to them, uh, attached to them. So for example, you can see here, Kidnapping Mountains, Friendship of Nations, Mirrors for Princes. Again, you have here, Kidnapping Mountains, uh, Friendship of Nations, Mirrors for Princes. Some, so some cycles have publications, some don't. But tonight we're gonna to talk about friendship of nations, which is a relationship between Poland and Iran and the pickle politics, uh, politica, politica fermentatze, fermentation politics. What, why, how to look at pickling as a way to, to understand better questions of the enlightenment, uh, colonialism and, uh, and other uh, more complex subjects. So our methodology as artists uh, is, the kind of what we call the kind of uh, metaphysical splits, the metaphysical spagat. So how can we really split our legs, not our legs, but our minds over around two ideas, which are considered to be antithetical or exclusive to each other. So for example, religiosity and humor. Most of the time, faith and humor don't really work together. Or if it, they do, it's usually always humor making fun of faith. But actually, how can you be somebody who's using faith in a progressive way, but also combining it with satire? or let's say pop culture and linguistics. Uh, so these are the kind of English terms for these, this kind of dynamic of bringing in one voice, one phrase, one space, two contradictory, let's say mutually exclusive things. Now, we often use the, 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 I, the, the mascot or the symbol of, the, of Mola Nasreddin, uh, who's a figure, a kind of 12th century uh, fool uh, you find him everywhere. There was uh, important Muslim populations from Croatia all the way to China in the east and down to Somalia and Sudan. And he's a kind of he's a wise fool, uh, a little bit like a kind of a, a kind of trickster figure, and he's often riding backwards on his donkey. Now, Mullah Nasreddin is somebody is a, is a really important mascot for us because he uses humor as a way to ask very simple, stupid questions to very important and reveal larger, more complex subject matter. And this is a kind of strategy that we often use. Even before we knew who Mullah Nasruddin was, we were working like this. I call this kind of stupid media. And what I mean by stupid medium is how can we choose very basic, uh, basically the more basic and, and, and low level and uh, our medium is, the more I can push the content to be esoteric and obscure and difficult. Because when you're, uh, as, as an artist, I'm very aware, we're all aware in Slavs and others, that most people in the world don't really care. They don't give a shit about the subject matter which interests us. So for example, Uyghur po language politics, let's say the Uyghur script. Uyghurs are the Turkic peoples living in Western China. You might've heard about them recently in the news. I know most of the time people don't care about this stuff. They don't even know where Kazakhstan is, most people in the art, in the art world. But, it's, but by choosing what I call stupid medium or humor, uh, we can slowly find a way to meet our audience halfway. So uh, Nasruddin is a, is a perfect figure for this because he's also using humor to, to talk about much more delicate subject matter. For example, ethics, relativism, morality. A typical Nasruddin story is, uh, Somebody asks Mullah Nasruddin, why are you always riding backwards on your donkey? And Nasruddin answers, well, there's no point in both of us facing the same way. Uh, one person asks Nasruddin on, uh, from one side of the river, Mullah Nasruddin, how do I get to the other side of the river? And Nasruddin answers, you are on the other side of the river. 
So in a very simple, stupid uh, type of humor, um, he's revealing questions of, of perspective, relativism, morality, and etc. I mean, in some ways you can say that he's a kind of precursor to Ali G and Borat uh, more recently, this kind of uh, satire, which through seemingly simple means is revealing the complex issues of the interlocutor. Now we look at Nasruddin furthermore as a kind of anti-modern figure, meaning that he's facing backwards because he's looking at the past, but he's moving to the future, right? So he's, he's really looking, and this is something which is against the questions of modernity. If you believe in the, in the, in the, the pillars of modernity, you believe, according to Marx, Freud, uh, Durkheim, whoever it is, Weber, that the modern world is a new kind of human being. It's not very different from Homo Sovieticus, the kind of, not very different from the communist idea, which was that how to create a new man. Modernity created a new human being. Uh, we don't believe this. We don't, we're not against modernity, but we don't believe that, that humans are fundamentally different today than they were two, 300 years ago. And uh, there's a very good book in French, in Spanish as well, unfortunately, only not in English, about this in the literary tradition on the right, you can see, by Antoine Compagnon. He writes, he says, the true modernists are those people who actually are a little bit suspicious of, of the modern era, like Barth, uh, Baudelaire, Sartre, the philosopher famously said that Baudelaire is driving into the future, but always an eye on the rearview mirror, looking over his shoulder. This is in some ways how we kind of position ourselves. And, uh, and even if you look about the way that time is, is, is described in our languages in Polish and Russian and, and English and French, we always say the future is ahead of us and the past is behind us, which is a little bit uh, a pity because it implies that the future is sort of clear, it's ahead of us, we can see it, and that the past is irrelevant because it's behind us and invisible. Whereas it's the opposite, right? We kind of, we, we know the past, we can know the past. So at least we should face that way. Whereas the future, there's no way to know what's going to happen. I mean, uh, the events of the past 10 years or even one year has shown that. Here's a very good example of this kind of what I call this, this sort of a very simple sort of, let's say, one technique of this sort of stupid technique is, is transliteration, right? The, 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 the transcribing of a, this, uh, not translation, not too much, it, but how to transcribe uh, in the same uh, language in a using a different alphabet. So on the bottom, you can see it says, dig the booty of monoglots, but marry my child a polyglot. So for those of you who are not very familiar with sort of slang English, this is saying, essentially, if you want to, excuse my French, if you want to fuck around and have a one night stand, do so with somebody who speaks one language, but if you want to settle down, better to do so with speak somebody who speaks many languages. Now above, for those of you who might or might not read Cyrillic or Persian and Arabic, it's the exact same phrase, Dig the booty of monoglots, but, and same here, dig the booty of monoglots. It's the same sentence, but transcribed. Why transliteration? Because transliteration is one of these things that people don't think about very much intellectually, but it's actually a very uh, interesting perspective. If you speak or read or write a non-Latin based language, which is many people in the world, whether it's Chinese, Arabic, Greek, etc., you're this trans transliteration is considered to be a kind of uh, a, a transactional, very cheap, very just purely practical way to make an, a language legible to another person, but not understandable necessarily, unless they speak that language, right? And uh, and we we've been exploring these these uh, this form of 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 how we can understand the kind of the, the politics of alphabets because alphabets are not innocent, naive things, right? There's, there's a reason why the Cyrillic alphabet accompanied the, 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 the Orthodox church and then communism, let's say five, 600 years later. There's a reason why Latin became a kind of secular language. Even the Soviets were considering to Latinize uh, Russian in the, early, in the early years of the, after the Bolshevik revolution because they considered the Cyrillic alphabet to be tainted with the Slavic, the Slavonic church, the Slavonic Orthodox faith. So they wanted a secular language, right? A sort of secular script. And of course, Arabic with Islam. Um, so what are the kind of important, uh, our most probably important publication so far is a, is a translation of a very important political satire from Azerbaijan in the early 20th century called Mola Nasruddin. It's named after this figure I just mentioned. Now, bear with me, I'm going to get into why, eventually into some artworks, uh, but you'll see that this is a work where 
probably the most important periodical sort of a magazine of the 20th century Muslim world. And it was we who translated it first, which is really strange because you would imagine that if you listen to your, for example, to the, the, the kind of most of the public discourse in the world today, that Islam, political Islam is some kind of threat, especially your government, sadly in Poland, that's always talking about Islam as some kind of threat or even in the United States or even in France, you would imagine that scholars would have translated the most important magazine of the Muslim world of the 20th century. This was published in Azerbaijan, Baku from 1906 to 1930, very progressive kind of for women's rights uh, against the kind of corruption, uh, imperialism, against the, the hypocrisy of the, of, the, of the mullahs, of the religious clerics. Uh, we translated it, we simply took drawings and we just translated the captions. This is a typical example. One, here's one drawing of, a, of using humor, of course, always. This is a, a, an Azeri man beating his wife and the same man being beaten by his Russian lover. So kind of showing the double standards applied to Muslim women, applied to Christian women. Um, and uh, the language politics of this magazine was very interesting because it was the first time Azeri was put on a level of literary language. Until then, Azeri was considered to be a kind of dialect. dialect. You would write either in Istanbul Turkish or in Russian if you were in Azerbaijan and not in Azerbaijani. And here you have like, you have Russian Duma members uh, tearing the tongue out of an Azeri man and, and stitching a Russian tongue, you know, imposing the Russian language. Now in, in Azerbaijan and much of the Soviet world, uh, Union, uh, the Muslim peoples of the Soviet Union had their alphabet changed three times in, in 60, 70 years, which is, which is quite a lot. So they were first Latinized uh, 1929 to 1939 because they considered it, Arabic to be the language of Islam. So they wanted to cut everybody from Islam and sort of push them into modernity. Then of course, Stalin became paranoid of a kind of pan-Turkism. So he serialized everything. And then when, when the Soviet Union fell, they went back to Latin. So you have this very strange situation in much, much of the Muslim world uh, of the Soviet Union, uh, former Soviet space, where you have uh, uh, three generations who can speak the same language, Azerbaijani, Kyrgyz, Kazakh, Uzbek, Dagestani, etc. Chechen, but they cannot read the same book because they have different scripts. So in some ways you become an immigrant in your own language. And this is something that for us, uh, if I can sort of uh, show you, um, led us to, I wanna show you how our books actually uh, precede the artworks. So the first time we came across Mola Nasruddin, we just did two pages in our first book, Kidnapping Mountains. Here you see the two pages. We then developed it into a, into a whole book, which is here. 200 pages, and now in second edition. Then it became a piece, which is here. And then it became another piece, which is, sorry, it became a second edition. And because the first edition was exhausted, then it became another piece, which is here. Now this piece has been shown, was commissioned for the Guangzhou Biennial, uh, and then was shown in, in uh, this is in Yinshuan in China. It's been shown in, in, uh, in, in Lublin as well by Ander Rotenberg. Um, and it's, a, it's essentially a kind of a, a, like a typical, ride that kids would, you know, outside of a supermarket or a sklep, you have a ride, you have, instead of this having sort of this very lazy, what I call kind of lazy American cultural imperialism, which is like to have a cowboy and Indian, which has no relationship to Poland or Turkey or Iran, we thought, why not have actually somebody who's relevant to our region? So somebody like Mola Nasruddin. Now, the first thing that a child who sits on this uh, is going to do is going to ask his, his or her uh, parents why the hell is this old man facing me? Why am I holding an old man's belly instead of his back? And, and by this gesture, the parent has to, has to present these questions, these complex questions about time, history, progress, moralism to a child in the same way that Mullah Nasruddin presents these issues in joke manner, right? So it's kind of, it's a, it's a very, again, a very simple gesture that through which or behind which there's, you can peel different layers. Uh, it was also of course shown at the Zamek Ryazdowski in our survey show in 2016. Mm. Another issue that we tend to uh, kind of topic as you might have mentioned, I might have mentioned is the issue of religiosity in, in faith. Now, most intellectuals, especially liberal intellectuals or let's say progressive intellectuals uh, in, the, in Europe and in the, in the West, as well as in the Middle East and other places, Poland, of, of course, as well. Most are kind of consider themselves to be post-religious uh, or so secular. The religious religion is considered to be for the masses, not the very intelligent people. 
not the very enlightened people, but we, of course, intellectuals are post uh, post secular in that sense. And this is something we have an issue with because for many reasons, but simply religiosity is, 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 an, is an enormous repository of, of human knowledge and to ignore it or to dismiss it the way the intellectuals have done for 200 years, I would say since the enlightenment essentially in the West is, is in some ways has led us to where we are today. Meaning that I, I don't believe that we should all be religious, I, 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 but I do believe that we cannot, you cannot leave something uh, into the hands of others like we've done with religion. We've left it into other people's hands for 400 years. And then we have the gall, the chutzpah to say, no, 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 this is not true Christianity. This is not true Catholicism. So when people of the Catholic church in Poland or in peace members say that, that this is what Catholicism is, we as intellectuals don't have the legitimacy to answer unless we actually are involved in that faith. And same with Muslims vis-a-vis -vis extremism in, in Islam or Jews vis-a-vis -vis extremism in, in Judaism. Now, this is a piece where it's a kind of a, a prayer bead like you have in the Catholic church, like you have in Islam, and it's prayer bead that, that people can ride. Now, you would imagine maybe that sometimes uh, some of this work is considered to be blasphemous or controversial. And I would say that actually the opposite is, one thing that I'm very proud of is that we've never caused the controversy anywhere we've shown work, even though we've shown difficult work in very sensitive places, like the Emirates, like Iran, like China, like Russia. And we deal with relatively political subject matter I would say the reason why we don't have that kind of reaction, first of all, is we don't seek it. That's not what we're looking after. We're not, if our work is political, it's political in a way that doesn't speak at you, it speaks with you. And it goes back to our origins as a reading group. Because in a reading group, there is no hierarchy. There is no, there is no person who knows everything and telling everybody else how they, what they should know. A reading group is a kind of sharing of, of knowledge. And essentially that's what, I think that position is felt, is, is respected by the public because it's open-ended in a sense, right? Is that we're interested in this subject matter and we're very interested for other people to join us in that pursuit of subject matter. Now, a very again, another example of a very simple, stupid medium is a balloon or a monobrow. Um, a monobrow, as you might know, I don't know, uh, is, is, a very, is one sort of epiphenomenon, a small phenomenon through which, again, we can explore much more uh, serious subject matters. For example, in the Middle East and the Caucasus, especially sort of Iran and the Caucasus, a monobrow is a sign of virility for men, a beauty for women. If you've seen the paintings of Ajar, Qajar women in 19th century princesses, and uh, they have this incredible strong monobrow. Really the eyes, eyebrows, and, eye, and eyelashes are, this, are really the signs of beauty, and especially this monobrow. So we simply did a kind of what we call a monobrow manifesto. On one side, we have a monobrow that's hot, on another side, we show, of course, in the West, it's opposite. If you have a monobrow in the West, uh, as a child, your life is over almost. At least your, your youth is over. You will not have many friends. You will not have any boyfriends or girlfriends. You know, you will be sort of written off. And this kind of very typical example of a monobrow is, is Bert from Sesame Street, you know, a kind of a very not hot version of a monobrow. And again, through this monobrow manifesto, it's, it's a way for, for us to discuss larger questions of, of representation, uh, ideal beauty, and uh, that are sometimes polemicized unnecessarily, let's say. Now that work comes from a cycle I mentioned that I, I wanted to talk to you about. So it's one of our most exhibited cycles of work. It's called Friendship of Nations, Polish Shiite Showbiz. And it looks at the relationship between Poland and Iran from the 17th century all the way to the 21st century. And it takes different forms. And it really started as a, as a Actually, again, it started as a contribution to a magazine, 032C, a kind of today become as very, uh, it used to be a very cult magazine. Now it's become quite important fashion magazine, uh, a, a Berlin-based magazine. And it was a, it was a commission from the editor, uh, Jörg Koch, in, in 2009 to think about 1989 and to think about 1979. And 1989 was the end of, one, of let's say, the first, uh, the, the, the major, geopolitical narrative of the 20th century, communism, right? Everything from 1917, the Russian revolution to 1989, kind of the 1917 defined the 20th century and 1989 and largely Poland's Solidarność movement helped kind of close that, that uh, story. And 1979 is the equivalent of 1917 in the sense that 1979 in Iran was a revolution and it launched the idea of political Islam in the modern world in a way that we're still living through it, right? Everything we're seeing really over the past 30 years, 40 years since the Iranian revolution, and it's not a coincidence that 
when Iran's revolution happened in 1979, Iran was rising to challenge the West and the Soviet Union had invaded Afghanistan and was declining. And 10 years later, the Soviet Union would no longer exist and Iran would become the only, let's say, remaining country to challenge the United States, even if it's completely disparate and, uh, and uh, an unequal challenge. It was still the only kind of, after the fall of, the, of, of communism, there was no narrative uh, that remained to challenge the kind of the Western neoliberal narrative of consumerism. And so Iran was the only one that provided a narrative, whether you agree with it or not, and we don't agree with it, but that was the only sort of coherent ideology, which was a kind of third worldism uh, mixed with uh, a little bit soft Marxism and Khomeinism, a kind of Shia version of Marxism in some sense. Now, what we did is we created 10 banners that were stitched by people in, 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 uh, in, in Wovich as well as people in Tehran. And, and what we did through this project was we discovered the more we dug into this relationship between Iran and Poland, we realized that there's a lot of interesting overlaps between the in certain moments of uh, these two countries shared history. For example, uh, Sarmatism in the 17th century, you know, uh, Polish nobility, the Shlachta believed that they came from some uh, long lost tribe on the on the on the Black Sea and Caspian Sea called Sarmats, kind of Iranians. It's all nonsense. It's kind of romantic and reactionary kind of uh, form of, of of class distinction. But they it doesn't matter. What's interesting is they dressed as they imagined Orientals or Persians to dress at the time, wearing these long swords that they called shamsir from the Persian word, long Turkish robes, sort of sorry fur coats and robes. And it was, if you look, especially at the time, the other uh, European, it was a way to distinguish themselves from other European nobility also, because the Dutch portraits at the time were very effeminate, right? This was a kind of a way to out-macho Western uh, aristocrats in this Polish-Lithuanian uh, Commonwealth. Now that's one episode of, of this common history. There's another episode, of course, the famous exodus to Iran of Anders' army during the Second World War, where the, the Polish troops were brought to Iran to become healthy to then go fight on the side of the allies. But more importantly, as we, discuss, as we realize it, is that there's a whole number of very interesting parallels between Shiism and Catholicism. First of all, you have 12 apostles in Catholicism. We in, Shia, Shia, in, 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 in Iranian Shiism, we have 12 Imams. The 12th Imam is coming back at the end of time. Like, his name is Mahdi, like Jesus, to kind of uh, to, uh, judgment day. You have in Catholic processions, this is why we chose these banners. You have these Catholic processions with banner processions. We similarly have the same thing during one time a year called Muharram, where we have these marches with, with uh, banners. And the Catholic Catholicism used to have the kind of self-flagellation where Shias also have the self-flagellation during Muharram. And I can go on and on. There's Malarzo uh, Nashkle, painting behind glass. Uh, Iranian uh, Shiism also has this kind of painting behind glass. Uh, and so we decided to kind of, to share the best practices, essentially what could Poland in 2009, which was a much healthier version of Solidarność than today, unfortunately, what could Poland in 2009 teach Iran? Because Iran it was, what could Poland teach in its struggle against communism to Iran and its struggle against political Islam? And so you have these kind of uh, creolization of, of messages like these, the, the, the slogans from Solidarność or, the, or, or Alternativa Pomaranchova. Here you have Pomoc Milicie, uh, help the militia, beat yourself up. <clears throat> on the right is the translation literally of the famous uh, graffito on, uh, in Gdańsk, Tirko Solidarność i Cierpivos, like only solidarity and, and patience will secure our victory. On the right is the uh, translation of that in the Persian. But while we were doing this project, of course, the Iranian uh, presidential elections happened in 2009. And if you remember, there was a protest, important protest movement. And interestingly enough, this is two years before the Arab Spring, the Iranian leaders of this green movement started to look to Poland as an example of, of civil disobedience. So for the first time, all of a sudden, some of these Polish thinkers were being translated into Persian while we're doing this project. Uh, from Szymborska to Zygmunt Bauman to Leszek Kowakowski to Czesław Miłosz. And because Iran was looking to Poland as a kind of example of a successful revolution. Now, how successful that is today is a, is a completely different topic because times have changed sadly and quite dramatically in the past uh, 10 years. Um, 
this is a piece that's called Wheat Mola, and it takes, again, what I would consider to be a very simple subject matter, a simple medium, stupid medium, which is wheat. Uh, I don't know what it is in Poland, in Polish and Russian, pszenica. And wheat is an interesting symbol because it's it's a leftist symbol, of course, and all the, if you remember the kind of the Soviet uh, uh, emblem, gerb, there's a kind of wheat on both sides. The Iranian revolution has the exact same thing. On one side is wheat, on the other side is tulips. It's a, it's a, it's a leftist symbol par excellence. And we made a, a, a Shia turban out of this wheat and the brick, of course, a, a, a symbol of, 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 of protests, of, of anti-establishment. Uh, and we wanted to kind of combine. Also, it was, for us, it was a way to remind people that if the Iranian revolution was not an Islamic revolution in the beginning. It was a, it was a, it was a national revolution of different factions, like you had in Egypt recently in 2011. It was a revolution of Trotskyist, nationalist, uh, everybody, I mean, and of course, Islamists, and it was later appropriated by the Islamists, but it's important to remember it was a leftist revolution. And that in some ways, uh, Marx and Mohammed are not very different from each other. They both are providing a, a, a philosophy that's totalizing, which means it's a bit scary if it's applied too rigorously, but also a philosophy which is, believes that there shall be one world or there shall be none. You cannot have such disparate equal inequalities in a world uh, that functions sort of, that has a, a real imminence. Um, another uh, medium we used for this project was the Pionki. And Pionki is kind of, again, a very considered a folk tradition, but considered to be kind of a, a low art form as a craft, which, I, which we of course uh, uh, dispute, but it uses very ephemeral material, you know, eggs, straw, <coughs> paper, and we, essentially uh, replace the, the, the Polish or the, let's say it's actually, it's not only Polish in Belarus, you find it of course as well in Ukraine. And that's also the wheat I should say is a really, you find that in Ukraine, Dajinki, these kind of wheat uh, sculptures. And we replaced it with, with Shia symbols. And of course, here's like um, uh, some more geometric versions of uh, Payank. Uh, here you have what we call the Solidarność Payanki. Uh, on the right, you have more Shia symbols from Muharram, and on the left, you have the inside is a symbol of the Iranian flag, which is literally the logo is a is a is a conceptualization of the word Allah. Also, we took the the Vichinanki um, tradition and and replaced the this really uh, um, how would I say it politely? I find it very disturbing how much. Polsko Valchensa uh, stickers that are all over Poland over the past, more and more every time I go to Poland, this kind of obsession with the Polish uprising, which is, it was an important member of, uh, element of history, but it's become sadly a tool of a kind of uh, shortcut of a form of really simplistic, reductive nationalism. And we replaced this symbol of the eagle with the Seymour. Seymour is a is an important Sufi uh, mystical bird. And uh, this mystical bird is, uh, is, is, is very interesting this Seymour because it's a bird in a kind of that you only will reach once you reach Nirvana on kind of the equivalent of Buddhist Nirvana. It lives behind the mountain. The Seymour is, uh, is also was an inspiration for the avatar uh, birds in that, uh, in that James Cameron film. And here we have the Vichinanki against the kind of Kufic uh, backdrop. Now, Another example of what I would call a relatively simple or si simple stupid subject matter is, is our works called the kebab, kitab kebabs. Now, I should pause here and say that one of the reasons we started Slavs and Tatars was not only to, to explore this region between the former Berlin Wall and the Great Wall of China, which is our geographic remit, our geographic focus, but it's also to explore forms of knowledge which are not being taught to us in our normal institutions, let's say universities, cultural institutions. And what I mean by that is that, again, since the enlightenment, there's been so much focus on, on the brain since Descartes' uh, cogito ergo sum, there's been so much focus on the brain at the expense of the rest of the body, right? So there are other forms of knowledge that are not cerebral knowledge. There is metaphysical knowledge. There is esoteric knowledge. There is digestive knowledge. There's emotional knowledge. There's affective knowledge. There's phenomenal, phenomenological knowledge. So we wanted to understand what are other, how can we approach these things in, in other forms? And that's why we're, our, our work on linguistics talks about these organs, 
That's why here in Kitab Kebab, Kitab Kebab literally means a book kebab. Kitab means book in Turkish, Arabic, Persian. And um, this Kitab Kebab, it's, it's, a, it's an attempt to really understand that also to, uh, to explore the idea that books are not, are almost talismanic uh, objects, right? Because if you read a book when you're 15 years old, and in love, and you read a book when you're 50 years old and 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 heartbroken, it, that same book will have a very different effect on you. But also, sometimes the relationship you have with a book is not a cerebral one. Sometimes it's with your your heart, with your stomach. And funny enough, uh, a collector of ours, uh, this is this piece actually, this kebab uh, with uh, Kapuscinski, I'm very happy to say, is in the collection of the Wiesdowski, uh, Zamek And um, and uh, one of the collectors mentioned who, uh, who was a neurosurge, neuro, neurologist. So he mentioned that actually nowadays in Western uh, universities, medical schools, when you're studying to, be, to become a neurologist, they ask you to also study gastroenterology, so the stomach and digestive system as well. Why? Because finally, Western medicine is beginning to understand that the stomach or the digestive system is an equally complex and articulate organ to the brain but we don't understand it because we've basically dismissed it at the expense of the brain for the past five, 600 years. So that in fact, they're quite linked, right? That we know this now, Ayurvedic medicine understands this, other Chinese medicine definitely understands this, but this is something which is relatively recent in, in Western medicine. Mm. Again, another example of a book which preceded works. One of our first books is called uh, Love Me, Love Me Not. It's a compendium, a collection of 150 cities whose names have changed throughout history, according to which empires or nations these cities belong to. This is my favorite page of the book. It's a city in present day Tajikistan called Khojand. It used to be called Alexandria the furthest. Why? Because it was the furthest Alexandria, furthest Alexander got. Then it was called Khojand. Then it became Leninabad, which is of course during communism. Leninabad means the, 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 home, the dwelling of Lenin. And then it became Khojand after communism. Now, this existed as a book and then it existed as mirrors that people can look, see themselves in. Of course, this uh, Gdańsk is, some, is a much more familiar one for our audience this evening, but not, no, no less interesting, of course, the different uh, names and transliterations and transcriptions of Gdańsk uh, throughout history. Um, now, let me go back to uh, the, the works here. Now, I mentioned this, this question of transliteration. Mm -hmm. These are a series of works which we showed uh, in Venice uh, at the last biennial. All these are, are, are examples of, of, so all of these are, are, are mm, how would I say it? These are all panels, like vacuum formed signs, but they're using an alphabet that's not, or a spelling, which is not uh, appropriate for the language. And I'll take just as an example, uh, the Polish ones you can see, Jauzers Jezik. Jauzers is a very kind of, is a very English uh, cartoon, like a comic book. Jauzers means like, wow. Ja and it's using this kind of, how to, how to approximate the owl in, in, in uh, the owl in Polish in English, which we don't have this nasal, right? Polish is one of the few Slavic languages that has the nasal sounds. Uh, Serbian has one, but really Russian doesn't have any. Uh, and uh, neither does Czech, et cetera, et cetera. Now, mm, or the, the bottom right, a less uh, polite uh, version of a Polish vacuum, odd bit, of course, uh, there used to be a letter in the Cyrillic language, Cyrillic script, which is this letter here. And it was called, it was called the odd, odd bit. And I just thought it was really interesting that odd bit is rectum in Polish, right? So the asshole. And I just think it's really interesting that if you break down odd bit, it's like odd and boots, like come, where you come from or being from, that unlike Courbet's sort of vagina, the origine du monde, in some ways the Polish language believes that uh, we all come from the asshole, which I think is a much more uh, fun existence actually than coming from the vagina. Um, now, there, another example of this uh, vacuum form is the one in the middle here in Arabic. You see with the bubbles uh, right here. You might be familiar with this kind of really simple, stupid humor. Of course, one of the challenges is, as an artist is not to take 
the high and bring it low, but of course take the low and bring it back high. Now, this is an example of something which was high, let's say, to be or not to be was made into a kind of stupid t-shirt that you find in Amsterdam or in American universities, sort of frat boy, to be or not to be. It's taken a question of existence and it's really brought it down to a question of consumption, right? An existential question has become a question of choice. Now, how can we return this question of choice, a stupid question of to drink a beer or not to drink a beer, or to drink two beers or not to drink two beers, how do we return it to a question of existence? Now, if you write in Arabic, the script of Islam, of course, as a Muslim, to drink a beer or not to drink a beer is not a question merely of choice. It's a question of belonging, community, identity, and existence again. So we return that sort of philosophical gravitas to the original uh, propo. Now, the last cycle I want to talk about is called pickle politics. It's our most recent cycle of work. We've recently launched a project space a few doors down from our studio called Pickle Bar, where we invite other artists to explore the limits of language in a kind of bar kishonki, a kind of uh, where people can drink the juices, the the the, the sok, the the, the, the the basically pickle juice, and different spirits but uh, also explore these limits of language and a kind of, now the question is why, why pickling? Not because it's a kind of hipster thing that you find in, uh, in, 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 uh, in the kind of foodie culture nowadays, but because pickling for us is again, another example of a very simple, stupid medium, right? What is a pickle? It's a, a gurek, it's kapusta with salt and water that our grandmothers have been doing for decades and if not centuries. It's very basic peasant kind of uh, rural thing, but it's also quite complex because first of all, um, the, the pickling is something which comes from the, the Mongol actually uh, step. It's, it's, it's all the pickling from Korea to Slavic countries is traced back to the, the hordes on the step, the nomad, because it was a way of preserving food. But it's interesting that while something like pickling becomes hipster in the West, it comes at the same time, it accompanies this kind of uh, rise in xenophobia against the very people that the West has defined itself, right? The West has defined itself historically from Herodotus to Hitler to Kaczynski and peace uh, against the kind of the Muslims, the Tatars, the Hordes, the Mongols, the Greeks were against the barbarians, which were essentially starting in Crimea, everywhere East. Um, and pickling is also a form of what's interesting is it, it challenges this very enlightenment idea of binary thinking, right? Binary, the binary of the enlightenment sees the world in black and white, rational, irrational, religious, secular, uh, dark and light. And pickling essentially is a form of preservation through managed decomposition. So you're, you're rotting something to preserve it. That, that in and of itself is a kind of challenge to the very binary notions of the Enlightenment. When we first showed this uh, pickle politics, uh, our first exhibition uh, in this cycle was at uh, our gallery in Warsaw and Raster on Spulna and, uh, and it was called Tavarjistvo Shubratsov and it was about a 19th century um, literary organization uh, that was a kind of very interesting organization from Vil from uh, from Vilnius because it it was a kind of a, a thorn in the side of the, this romantic uh, uh, uh idea of Polish identity, which was really their their understanding of Polish identity. Even though they're from the, the this uh, from the from the territories that are no longer Poland today, and that were basically in some ways you could argue or colonial outposts or not colonial, but let's say problematic ish, uh, margins of the Polish identity. Um, their understanding of identity was rather reductive, right? And they didn't, it, it was a really, it was, first of all, it was, it was uh, anti-Russian in a way that would make perfect sense to today, the, the parties in power today in Poland. It was uh, wholly focused on a kind of martyrdom of, of, uh, of Polish identity. And it would, didn't understand humor. It didn't understand satire in the way that people like uh, Senkowski, who was one of the, the founders of this uh, society, this Tawarzystwo, um, and so we had a material about this society, which is a little bit forgotten in some sense. And, and the poster is a poster called Agurek Trotsky. There's a famous Agurek uh, from Trotsky, not from nothing to do with the person Trotsky, of course, from the Trakai, the, 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 the town outside of uh, Vilnius, 
where uh, it was considered to be a kind of a, 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 um, a um, Tatar uh, village of Karaim Tatars, this kind of this anti-rabbinical, essentially a sect of Judaism uh, from Crimea that had had a certain kind of pickle, which was meant to be a very good for pickling. And, um, and so we've continued to develop this, this body of work about pickling, but again, it's, it's, it's a way for us to engage with, if, if we do an exhibition called Tvarjistvo Shubratsov, where we simply show documents on walls and we show Senkovsky and everything you see is about Senkovsky and 19th century Vilnius, et cetera, et cetera. It would bore the, t the death out of most people uh, in Poland, not to mention outside of the country would be completely irrelevant, right? So in some ways, these are humor, pop, let's say pop culture. These are tools for us to essentially uh, further explore in a kind of in a in a in a sustainable way our own interests. Um, this is on the right is a sign outside of our pickle bar uh, called Open Mic, uh, and this is a, 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 sh a picture from our recent exhibition, which is unfortunately closed at the moment in uh, in Nice in the south of France at the Vida Arson, a very good art school uh, in Nice, and uh, I think that is that is. Ah, the last pieces are here, sorry. Um, in Venice, we also showed a water bottle that's uh, a water sorry, fountain, a water kind of cooler where you have a kind of a garlic wrapped in a turban again, and we made our own pickle juice. Also, what's interesting about this pickle juice, if you saw the video uh, in the beginning of the, that, that was sent in advance of this talk, which you can see here, um, what's interesting about this, this, uh, this curtain or this pickle juice is that Pickle juice is also a very simple, sort of simple, stupid subject matter in the sense that it, it in the East, pickle juice is, of course, uh, the day after a hangover, right? It's a hangover cure. But in the West, pickle juice has become a kind of sports drink. It's become a performance drink. And this, what's interesting is that something so simple shows certain attitudes towards time, right? And, and if, in the, if in the East, it's kind of, it's a way of, of restoring the destruction that was made before. In the West, pickle juice is a, uh, is a form of positivism, right? A very typical kind of, let's say Anglo-American form of positive performance, the gym, before I go and run, I have to drink pickle juice, like Gatorade in some sense. Um, I think that's it. And I would, um, now, for the questions and answers, uh, I think uh, I could also just briefly mention that uh, in addition to the pickle bar, as I mentioned, there's a pickle bar uh, in our sort of two or three streets, two or three buildings down from our studio in Moabit in Berlin. This is the space where we invite uh, performers, uh, lecturers to, to explore certain topics. This is a bar which we've created for the pickle, uh, for the pickle bar. It's based on a crowd control mechanism. You can see another example of this here. Uh, and uh, and essentially it's a kind of crowd control that we've simply added a, a bar and a reading stand to, to it. Um, and we also, as, as uh, Vera mentioned, we're in the process of a kind of, I would say a, a, a small scale rogue uh, institutionalization in the sense that uh, we opened a residency and mentorship program for young professionals from our region um, in 2018. And we've had a, quite a lot of Belarusians since then and Belarusians, as well as uh, uh, cultural professionals from Armenia, uh, Georgia, uh, Russia, and Turkey. Um, and the studio, the, the residency is, what's interesting about this mentorship program, I guess it's not like a residency in the sense that the participants spend three days with us in the studio working on Stas and Tadar's projects in a way to understand, I guess, some of the skills that uh, art schools don't teach you, even the best art schools in the world, meaning the kind of, the, the, what I call the kind of the back office Type stuff. I mean, intellectual stuff we can always talk about and we always do talk about, but I think it's unfortunate, again, it's, it's been at the expense of more practical uh, skills, which are how to deal with galleries, how to price your work, how to present your work, how to archive your work, how to negotiate with institutions. Uh, basically questions that enable us to continue doing what we love doing past the age of 30, so we don't burn out uh, and, uh, and, and stop, essentially. Um, I'll stop sharing here. And uh, hopefully, uh, open up 
uh, the, the floor. I think that the question answer is correct. Um, I'm going to write in the chat some of these answers because some of the questions are kind of too. Uh, uh, so somebody's asked, is it Nasreddin or Nasreddin? It's actually Nasreddin. Uh, and he's written either Hoja in Turkish, uh, Hoja Nasreddin. In Iran, he's known as, Pol as Mola Nasreddin. You can find him online. And in Arabic world, he's Joha Nasreddin. And in China, he's Afanti Nasreddin. Uh, hello, I've got two questions from Ursula. That was for Alicia, sorry. Uh, Ursula has asked in one short sentence, what is art for you? I cannot answer that question. If you were to give an advice for young creators, what would that advice be? Uh, hmm. If I were to give advice to young creators, I would, I would say that, you know, the uh, creators uh, is a difficult. I don't really. I mean, creatives meaning all types of creators. I assume, um, at least in my personal experience, I can say that there's a lot of talented, creative people in the world. The distinction between those who who somewhat succeed to have a sustainable to 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 live off of what they're doing and those who don't is often a case of 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 persistence rigor professionalism that's it's sorely lacking in our milieu so there's a kind of a, 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 i understand that there's a resistance to professionalism because the flip side is that people are afraid of kind of becoming managerial classes that were essentially just professionalizing we're losing touch with what drives us the kind of the spiritual creative side but actually I don't see a dichotomy. And I think that uh, one of the reasons I would say that um, much to our own surprise, Slavs and Tatars really took off real quickly. I mean, when we started 2006, we both had full-time jobs, Kasha and myself. Uh, we, didn't expect to, we didn't expect to be doing exhibitions in major museums in three or four years. We didn't expect to leave our, our own jobs uh, so quickly. Well, I didn't leave for many years, but Kasha left uh, after three years, I think, um, to do focus on Slavs and Tatars exclusively. Now we're three core members, but I would say five or six people in the studio at any time. One of the, the, the differences is that we came from a, we had careers 10 years behind us in other fields. Uh, and there is this idea somehow, I don't know, in Poland probably less because even though Poland is now a comfortable member and I would say a rather prosperous country in the, in the, in, in the world relative to the rest of the world. Uh, there's an idea that somehow artists should be able to, all artists should live off of, what they're doing. And there's a, there's a, there, it's often looked down upon to get jobs doing other things. I think this is a huge mistake because I actually miss my former job, even when I was doing slots and others on the side. I think it's very important to do other things and other activities because it, it first of all, it frees your mind to, th I, I don't believe that, it, that the, the job of an artist is to be 24 hours an artist, essentially. I don't, that's, that's my personal view. I don't believe you're, we, at least we were not born to be artists in that sense. And I think that thinking about other people's problems, other people's tasks, other people's challenges is actually a very important uh, mental exercise to sharpen your own thought and your own time. And that's why when you see also, it's, it's, it's a little bit similar to when people have children, they, they, they quickly prioritize much better their time than when they didn't have children or they didn't have a, a other responsibilities beyond themselves, let's say. Mm, is it possible to get to the residency in Berlin for a photographer? Uh, that's a good question. It is possible. Um, the residency program is is in is 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 a partnership with other institutions. So often the Goethe Institute in various countries, Saha is another uh, institution in Turkey. Essentially, the it's it's with an institution that residents are picked or chosen. Um, because we of course cannot afford to subsidize. We can afford to subsidize part of the residency, but not fully. How does your group process work? Katarzyna asks, uh, do you discuss all the works together or are you responsible for a single work personally? So this is, I think, an important question uh, because there's a certain amount of mystery around how collectives work. In our collective, none of us are artists in our, as individuals. Uh, we don't exist as artists outside of Slavs and Tatars. Um, how it works is that yet we have very distinct responsibilities. So I am, for example, the, the front office of Slavs and Tatars in a sense. I, I joke that I'm the typical Middle Eastern man because I can talk a lot, uh, but I can't do much with my hands. Uh, but uh, essentially what happens is we, we choose, if you remember the, the, the cycles of research, let's say friendship of nations, we say we're gonna study Iran and Poland. 
we all do the research. So somebody actually collects the research for us, a researcher that we work with from JSTOR, from academic journals, et cetera. We read it together. We decide how we want to treat this research. Again, the question is, the, the, the real question is, what do we bring to the table as artists that has not already been brought to the table by academics, by journalists, by NGOs, by activists, by other people. And, um, and once we know what we want to do with the research as artists, do we want to create a book? Do we want to uh, do a sculpture? Then mm, we, we kind of branch off and each of us develops the, their, their uh, responsibilities separately. So I will do the writing, and, this, and the lectures, uh, Kasha will work on production of the work, Stan will work on the design of the books and the, and the mock-ups of the exhibitions, but we will edit each other throughout sort of the process, like a kind of DNA helix. Um, now, as I mentioned, we have three axes of our practice, exhibitions, publications, and lectures. Publications and lectures are essentially discursive, like tonight, very clear. If you read our books, all of our books, by the way, are available as for free as PDFs on our website. Um, if you read our books there and you listen to our lectures on, on our website as well, there's there they don't use difficult language. We're not. I never quote Agamben and uh, Rancière and uh, and uh, Lyotard and Althusser and I don't. We don't quote these kind of typical art speak. Even though we've read them, we just don't see a need to quote these people. Um, but so let's say our our lectures and books articulate certain things, like tonight, certain concerns, research issues. My belief is that the artwork with a capital A, the, ex the sculpture, the exhibition has to disarticulate. Now that's a very thorny, sensitive, slippery idea. What does it mean to disarticulate? It doesn't mean to stay silent. It means to undo, like when you pull the sweater, the, the thread from a sweater, it means undo the narrative you've just com composed with the books or with your lecture, right? In some ways, art has to scramble the message and not deliver it. That's just our perspective. Uh, Michaela, Slav nations are torn from a religion, political and language, meaning also alphabetical serial perspective. Do you think that art or anything that all can unite them? Could humor commonly understood? Part of the be remedy? Um, I don't know, that's, uh, I, that's not for me to answer. I think that humor is, uh, people. Some, many people believe that humor is language specific and I think that our work tries to challenge that idea or at least tries to do it in a very polyglot way. Uh, as I mentioned at the outset of the, of the talk tonight, it's an irony that I'm speaking in English. I, I, I'm sorry, I can't speak in Polish uh, well enough to do a, a, a lecture. Mm. But, uh, but I think that uh, we, you know, we try, you know, we've, we've created works in Polish, we've created works in Russian, we've created works in Georgian and Persian, et cetera. Uh, How are our beginnings in Berlin? We only moved to Berlin six years ago, seven years ago. We existed remotely. So in the beginning, Kasha was based in, in Holland. I was based in Moscow. Then uh, a third member joined and they were both in Brussels with Kasha and Boy was in Brussels. I was in Paris. And then we, we only came to the same city, all of us in 2013. Uh, Berlin, of course, is changing. As you know, it's getting more expensive, but it's still a, a very easy, much easier city. Let's say it's it's the only metropolis I know or the only capital of a major nation that I know where you don't have traffic, where you still can afford to live, where uh, it's, 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 uh, it's still a bubble in a sense. Uh, of course, that bubble is bursting slowly, but it's still, and, and to be honest, uh, the German uh, art infrastructure is the most, uh, sophisticated in the world. I mean, that's why you have kind of many s countries are basing their uh, cultural policy and, and creating art spaces on the German model of because it's the envy of the world. These, every small town has a Kunsthalle or Kunstverein or a, a Kunsthaus that's the, that has collections that would make most large cities in the world uh, jealous. I'm wondering if a general Polish public wouldn't actually get more from a historical explanation, exhibition of the pickle idea. Um, I'm not sure what is meant by a historical like explanation. One thing that I can say is that, uh, as I mentioned, our work is never directly addressing. So 
all this research that we do is never exhibited in the exhibition space, right? Uh, you never see, we never exhibited Mola Nasruddin, the satire journal on walls. We don't ever believe in putting discourse on walls. I think it's a big mistake. If you're doing research, I believe the research, you have to translate the research as an artist. I mean, you have to digest it, you have to break it. And what it means to break the research means you have to really know it very well to be able to break it. You have to, I often say, you have to disrespect your sources. But to disrespect your source, you have to respect your source extremely to be allowed to disrespect it. And to really respect it, you have to disrespect it because otherwise you're just regurgitating what's already been done. You're just recycling. And I don't believe that speaking directly about the subject matter is the role of the artist. I don't, as I, meant, as I mentioned earlier, I don't believe that's our task as artists. I think that our, I think that in some sense, we are the wise fools uh, in society that's trying desperately to be rational, uh, scientific, and, and positivist and, and success driven. I think it's the artist's job to be a little bit the wise fool, the kind of to ask seemingly simple, stupid questions, but not actually not so simple and not so stupid. Uh, one of the things I'm, I'm quite proud of is the fact that we have a very, uh, compared to most artists of our, our colleagues, we have a very popular following in the sense that not that we have a lot of followers, let's say on social media or in our public, but let's say mm, our work is accessible to non-art professionals. And that's very important for me is that, you know, the Polish dentist, the Iranian engineer, the, the Turkish uh, math teacher understand our work in, in a way that a lot of contemporary art isn't accessible because a lot of contemporary art is insular and, 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 and sort of speaking to itself or referencing art history, which is not a problem. Some great work is like this, but uh, it's not facing the the world, the public, in a sense. It's facing it. It's facing inwards and not facing outwards. And I and I and I don't think there's a problem with uh, accessibility to our work. I would say. Um, I love the empathy of your work. It is indeed a rare talent to show controversial work without offending. Can you point to works by other artists that you value for empathy, or in other words, works by artists you would like to see you work with? Uh, maybe I missed it, but can you say something about your visual language and its affiliation with social realism? I don't know about any affiliation with social realism. I'm happy for you, Akasha, to in, uh, inform me about that. I, uh, but uh, other works by art, uh, other, we have lots of artists who, whose work we, we, uh, we, and we admire very much. Uh, uh, one one artist, uh, Lawrence Abu Hamdan, is a is a, a very important sonic uh, art sonic uh, um, a private ear. He kind of does audio forensics. Um, uh, a lot of the artists that we exhibited in the recent show at the Dame Goyezdowski, uh, we are quite fond of uh, as well. Um, um, a very important Iranian artist, I'll write to you, who passed away. Uh, last year, his name is Sia Armajani. He's a very, he was really underrated artist, uh, but he's in major collections. He was he, incredibly famous in the 80s and 90s. He was in all the major collections and major vinyls and museums and sculpture park and documenta. But he kind of, he stopped making work and started to do only public works, like public infrastructure, bridges essentially, for, like with architecture. Uh, uh, very interesting work also uh, in the sense that uh, the questions of, I believe there's a kind of populism at work in our, practice, but I hope it's a kind of leftist populism uh, to use the, the phrase of Chantal Mouffe, not a right-wing populism, but I don't think there's any, I think there's nothing wrong with making complex works accessible to a large public. As, uh, I don't think it's about dumbing down. I think it's about simply, uh, it's a, for me, it's a position as, as, as it's, uh, it's an energy that the art engages with or not. What is the role of curators in our world? How do you curate shows by other artists? It's a good question because we just, <laughs> Did our first curating uh, a couple of years ago uh, for Ljubljana, the graphic arts biennial, which then traveled to Zamek Wojdowski. It was called uh, Crack Up, Crack Down. Um, it was interesting, uh, to be perfectly honest, because our work doesn't engage with the questions of art, let's say art history itself, we rarely think about other art. And it sounds weird to say this, we're not interested in art as a subject matter. We're interested in art as a language. Now, what that means is that the extent to which we think about other people's art really doesn't go beyond a conversation after an opening, an exhibition we see, a dinner. That's kind of, the, that's it. We never have the opportunity to think about other art because 
we have so much on our own plate because we're dealing with so much other questions of, uh, in our own research about ritual, about language, about traditions, about history. We just don't have the bandwidth to think about other art. Now, curating was great because it, it, it provided the opportunity to, to really think about other, our contemporary also, our, our generation, our, our colleagues work, but not as an end point, not as a kind of, as a fait accompli, a kind of a, a piece on a wall, but what it could become also, the potentialities of that work, where it could go, how it, what it could mean, and really to think about it professionally, really uh, intensely. And that was really nice. It was quite nice. It was nice, I would say, in a way, it's nice mm, to do something every once in a while. I wouldn't say I want to be a curator full time. It's a, it's a much more, uh, I would say, I've always respected curators in a way, almost more than artists, because I think it's a much more uh, selfless uh, profession uh, than being an artist. Um, but that's part of why we're institutionalizing a little bit is that, is that we want to allow, we want to further explore what we're interested in, all these questions, but it's not so important that we do everything ourselves. Meaning Slav and Tadar is a platform as much as it's a collective, right? It, it doesn't matter whether it's me or Kasha or Stan or whoever, Anastasia, who does the particular thing. What's important is that the questions that are being asked and if we can allow other people to give the platform to other people, provide the resource for other people to, to, to publish books, to do lectures, performances, uh, then then I don't see any reason why not. Uh, for for other reasons, we cannot let other people, we cannot let other artists do work under the name of Slavs and Tatars, but that's purely an economic question is that we have, uh, we have galleries, we have a collector base, and our work is not about questions of authorship. I mean, some artists do that. They, 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 their whole work is about questioning authorship. That's not the, that's not, again, the interest of, the, the main interest of Slavs and Tatars. Our interest is our region. Uh, how does the art residency with Slav and others work? I think I mentioned this. Um, so it's not only for artists. It's uh, I should say also it's it's equally for all different uh, roles in in the artistic ecosphere: curators, critics, researchers, managers, production people, as well as artists. And uh, the artist or curator or the resident mentor mentee comes for two months uh, to the residency spends three days a week with Slavs and others, working on Slavs and others, a, a certain project. And any given time, for example, right now, we are curating a program for the pickle bar pop-up at uh, in Vienna, where, uh, so there's always a little bit of curating, always some publishing going on. And there's always some, what I would call more traditional artwork, whatever that means in our practice, because there's no medium per se. Um, exhibition design, graphic design, there's all kinds of, so we, there's always, the reason we're able to do this mentorship program is because there's different things going on. Otherwise, if we were just doing art as one kind of medium, only mirrors like this, then there wouldn't be much space for a curator or a researcher really. Uh, and they spend three days a week with us. And then the other rest of the time on their own work that we had supervised or we can provide uh, uh, guidance, but it's, it's, it's subsidized, meaning it's, it's financed so that they can for the whole time so that they're, they're also have the means to spend time on their own work, of course. Um, and uh, and they live in the they live in the the the, the studio room I meant I show is actually just right behind there. It's at the end of our studio, so they actually the studio is their space after six p.m. We are very mm, boring in the sense that we work from sort of nine thirty to six, and nobody works late really. Unless it's, uh, if we're working late more than once, it means that we've badly organized ourselves. Uh, we don't romanticize this idea of, you know, hanging out all night, uh, doing all nighters, uh, drinking wine and doing work. We believe that people should have personal lives that's beyond their work, including ourselves. Uh, so yeah, the studio is really their space for the weekends as well. We're not here on the weekends. It's, uh, and so it's quite a large space for the, for the residents uh, and uh, quite a lot of resources in terms of uh, materials, uh, reference material as well, uh, libraries, et cetera. Uh, what do I think about the impact of meme culture to language? That's a tough one. We've been thinking a lot about meme culture recently because our recent exhibition I mentioned that we curated was about satire. And today satire is in some ways being, it, we're having a revolution of popular satire in the way that the 20th century did with this periodical I showed Mola Nasruddin at the same time in the early 20th century because printing technologies became available the way that internet and publishing materials, have, sorry, publishing software has made Photoshop and other kind of image making uh, stuff available to larger audiences recently, a kind of uh, satire from below. And uh, 
I think that there's a, a meme culture is interesting when it when it's dense. I believe in this density that again, this kind of I mean, a good example of this is here, yeah. You can see in this mirror, it says, What's the plan, Uzbekistan? I'm your man, Azerbaijan. Now, you could think that this is a one-liner, a very simple sort of one line, uh, simple joke has no depth to it. But what we're interested in is a question of depth behind the surface. Now, behind these kind of very simple one-liner is of course also a question of a whole movement of what was called Jadidism, a Muslim reform movement. When the first Muslim reformers were going from Azerbaijan across the Caspian to the, into the Central Asia, into Uzbekistan, the first opera in the, in the Muslim world, and the first theater performances, et cetera, et cetera. So, so uh, meme culture in a similar way is using this kind of very uh, first degree humor, but it only, for me, it only becomes interesting when it has legs and it can kind of, uh, it, can, it can continue to, uh, to provide meaning beyond that original uh, sense. Yeah, I'm interested in the figure of holy fool in different religions, Antony Lesowski asks. In Orthodox, it is known as Yurodive, and Hinduism, it's called Sadhu. Do you know of such a position in the Islamic world? Someone who's considered in some ways outside of the law because of his or her metaphysical practice. Yes, in the Muslim world, there was a very interesting um, movement of Sufis uh, called uh, Malamatia. I think it's called Malamatia. People of the blame. Um, and, uh, and of course, there's a very famous uh, Ashab, it's a very, very famous fool of the medieval times. It was, a, it was a kind of a wise fool. And there's a lot of writing about these, uh, these figures. Nasruddin is another one I mentioned, uh, but there's a, there's a strong tradition in Islam as well. Of, and this is what's, of course, what's very, you touched upon is in some ways in, in these Sufi uh, sects, the Malamatia, for example, they had to be, it's called antinomian in English, meaning that uh, they had to pr prove that they're outside of the, of the norms and of, uh, outside of, uh, of convention. So some of them would, for example, walk around naked. Some of them would, would, would make scatological jokes, or play with their genitalia in a way to show that they had kind of, in some ways, uh, annihilated themselves uh, as egos and sort of trans transcended into the, to the kind of the to divine love in some sense. Uh, but I, I'm happy. Antonio, if you send me um, an email to info at Slavs and Tatars, uh, I can send you a syllabus of a course we're teaching at the moment in the United States about, with the references to and, and reading material about this, uh, these uh, Muslim uh, wise fools and sort of satire. Uh, I can clearly see Philip Price says that your work is based on the general idea of advertising. Do you see any difference in the Eastern and Western schemes, motive of advertising in the popular media? Is there any way of mixing these inspirations for you? Mm. Uh, I can't say our work is based on the idea of advertising, but definitely advertising is as, 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 as one type of visual culture in, uh, informs our work, of course. Uh, it's really taking and it's kind of deconstructing certain visual codes. Uh, I don't know enough about advertising and I've never studied it to know if there's a difference in Eastern and Western um, advertising cultures. Uh, but, um, but what's interesting, I think also is when you take something uh, like, in a way that our uh, uh, our art, let's say, I, I talk about this wise fool, language is is it's very important to take certain things and and when I say work come to approach that subject matter, approach that word from behind. Mm. What I mean by that is it mm. how is it, what's a good example of that? I mean even uh, odd bit. I mean of course that's literally from behind, but but you know almost reifying, making a word or term or an idea so thick and so concrete in your mind that you can get behind it, that there's a kind of three dimensionality to it. You can go behind and approach it from behind. What, what, the reason I say from behind is behind means to subvert something. Also in English, through the back door is a very interesting colloquialism to say, of course, anal, like anal penetration, uh, but also it's a way, it's a, it's a way that uh, many places, when you would describe a euphemism, you would use to describe the entry point of a building for immigrants, for example. So in many racist societies, and like the United States, there were homes built with a diff different entrance for the help or the immigrants that were working there, the Latino, Black, uh, Muslim or not. And I like this idea of the back door because it, it brings together this question of kind of the marginal, the marginal, uh, the minor understanding of a, of a kind of major issue. 
Mm, wow, there's a lot of questions here. Uh, Hmm. Have you experienced things like banning your exhibition or some works because they were too controversial or misunderstood and considered to be somehow offensive, Sonia asks. In Poland, it happens sometimes, sometimes in very rational ways. As I mentioned, no, we've never been uh, censored. Um, and actually this eight page negative sort of character assassination of Slavs and Tatars uh, for a very respectable arts journal uh, accused us, said basically that they hoped, they wished for us that we would have our work banned more often because they believed that we were being complicit, that, that our work was, was not controversial enough. That's why it was able to be shown in places like Russia and the Emirates and Iran and, and in other places. Mm, again, I, I don't necessarily agree. I think that, uh, I think that, uh, I think there's a, it's a, it's a different approach to how you speak with an audience. I mean, if you remember the, the banners I showed you that were, hanging like this, the Polish Iranian banners and people were sitting down. That was a very key moment for us. It was kind of a very key moment in our career in 2011. Until then we'd only shown printed matter and really two dimensional work. And never had we been asked to invest in a space. And that's where our invitation to the MoMA and kind of that's really launched our career, let's say. What was interesting about that moment is that in that space in Sharjah, it became a, a meeting point for all the kind of elite art professionals who are traveling around the world, the curators of PS1 and MoMA, the curators of Tate, but also the bakers, the Afghan bakers and the, and the Baluchi, Pakistani builders, everybody felt comfortable in this space. And I think that's very important because it didn't look like a typical art space. Most of the, the, the participations in this biennial looked most, and this is if, as a, most of the time art is presented in an excruciatingly painfully obvious way that it's art, meaning that most of the time art is presented to make it very clear from a hundred meters away that it's art. What I mean by that, whether it's pedestals and lighting and this kind of, this solemn, serious language. Now there's nothing wrong with that per se, but if you think about it, if our job as artists is to enchant and, and scramble, as I said, to kind of the message and surprise and mesmerize, we've already given half of our, kind of revealed our cards. We've given half of the, our, power away if we're signaling from the very beginning that it's art, right? In some ways, the key is to make art that doesn't look or function traditionally as art. If it, if it functions in the same relation that most art does, which is a kind of a solemn relationship of, uh, of, uh, of let's say, um, you know, this is something that you should look at and you should contemplate. If that's already signaling in, in sort of uh, signposting from very far away, Again, it doesn't mean it's bad art. It just means it's it's lost the 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 possibility of of, uh, of disrupting. Let's say. Mm. Did you both of you and Kasha have to used to have your own artistic practice before you've met? No. Uh, I would like to ask Kar Karia asks uh, Karia if you work with any specific research centers, and if you do so, do you recommend one in particular? No, so according to the subject matter, the cycle of work, uh, the research topic, we collaborate with scholars at any given moment. So let's say at any given moment for each cycle, I would say we're collaborating with one or two scholars at least. Uh, and that depends on whatever institutions they're affiliated with. Uh, is irony Bogdan, is irony a proper tool in act activism today when everything is so political and the politics tries to influence both public and private? Mm. I don't like this term irony, and I'll tell you why. I think irony is something uh, that implies distance. I believe in a kind of humor that is inclusive, but also at your own expense. And I don't, and irony for me, again, is a little bit the problem I have with the enlightenment. The idea with the enlightenment is really, if you study something, you have to study it with a critical distance. You have to be neutral. You have to kind of put your white gloves. I would like to understand other forms of studying something. What about studying something where you are so intimate and so close to it with like a bear hug that you, it's sweaty and it's 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 messy and 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 humor for me has to also be the same. It has to be, uh, it has to be more affective. And irony for me implies not necessarily, but implies a kind of a, a very careful, a very considered, a very manageable, very clinical distance that I don't really believe uh, is is so strong. Um, 
But then Anitza Novich asks, but then this disrespectful act towards respected research, super hermetic, just an intellectual game of the researcher artists themselves. No, that's 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 the methodology. It doesn't mean that you have to ex exhibit this uh, this disrespect. It has it's a way of breaking the resources or breaking your research so that it actually can be accessible by people not necessarily interested in that topic. Um, again, if let's take the pickle politics. If I'm interested in, if I want to crit criticize binary thinking in the enlightenment, I wouldn't do myself any favors by doing an exhibition about the enlightenment, right? It's, 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 I believe that you have to tell stories through other stories. So the pickle is a vehicle, let's say. Uh, the monobrow, the manifest, the balloon is a vehicle. The monobrow is a vehicle through which I can tell other stories. Uh, but to find, identify which of those vehicles or platforms are interesting, these media, these stupid media, you have to, at some point, disrespect the source. Because if I go directly kind of in a linear way all the way towards the history of, of, of beauty in the, in the Caucasus, I'm not going to necessarily get to the question of, a, of Bert and the monobrow, right? I have to kind of, at some point, I have to get away from it to, to come back to it. I don't know if that makes sense. Uh, what was my first better job connected with art? The one that I liked and engaged in. How did you get it? Um, I used to work as a researcher, essentially kind of the, the, the positivist commercial aspect of what I'm doing now, uh, I used to do for public and private sector, for cities, for companies. And it wasn't better. It was just, uh, it's just, uh, I think it's, it's, uh, it's good to see how the real world works. And, 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 and it definitely gave me certain uh, experiences I wouldn't have been able to have if I went simply to art school. Um, and what do you do to make a living except Slavs and others? Thankfully, Slavs and others now can support, uh, I would say, three or four people, uh, but probably only three or four because we're living in Berlin and in New York would probably support one at best, if not, if not probably not even that. Uh, So Alicia Novich asks, say there's no problem with accessibility, but how, what could I gain from viewing the pickles packaging without knowing the whole story behind it? Again, <clears throat> um, I will share a screen again, just because uh, it was, uh, it's relevant here, is that uh, a very important kind of moment in our, in our, um, in our, in our exhibition history was at the MoMA in, in, in 2012, we were invited to do an exhibition and we decided to do an exhibition called Beyond Sense. Mm. Now, behind this wall of carpets and the kebab, you see people went behind and they saw this fountain with three uh, letters, kh, all the different letters, all the different letters kh in Arabic, Cyrillic, and, and uh, Hebrew. So the X is the Cyrillic, kh. You kind of have it in Polish, like chopaki, but you don't really have it as a letter. H in Arabic here, and behind the red fountain, you see the H in the Hebrew. It was black lit. The idea was to, what we wanted to do was kind of make a, a, uh, a uh, like a psychedelic Muslim library. That was the idea, like for ourselves. Like how could we make a psychedelic space that's also a kind of spiritual Muslim library? Now there's books on these benches, people can read them or, or they cannot. Now, this is a question which uh, is asked to us, um, Alicia quite often is if somebody doesn't know everything about the history of the he, how are they supposed to um, understand your work? Well, to be honest, if somebody simply goes into that space and just cuddles their partner for half an hour in the MoMA, which is like a train station of people just moving all the time and doesn't read the books and just looks at the red fountain and thinks about red, that's just as legitimate and uh, a, a, uh, an experience of the exhibition is somebody who goes in and knows the whole history of the letter huh as a sacred letter in Hebrew and Arabic and then Russian futurism. So it's it's there's not there's a there's not a right way to understand it, but like anything in life, the more you invest, the more you get out. Now the difference is is that again, most of the artists interested in that kind of subject matter would simply present that subject matter and say, mm, mm, fuck it. If people are not interested, that's not my problem. Well, actually, I think it is our problem. So we make, a, and I don't know many artists of our generation who make such an effort to, um, to include the mediation of the work in the conception of the work. 
most of the time mediation is something that comes afterwards by the museum staff, by the educational department, by the curators, critics, etc. We spent a, a hell of a lot of time thinking about mediation in the conception of the work. Now, it doesn't mean we're catering to a certain audience. It's in some sense, you could argue to use today's kind of uh, terminology, it's a kind of decanonization or decolonization because of the art experience. Because, and I know this as a fact now, because I know that I was always wondering why we have so many invitations to museums for artists that are not, let's say, uh, for our generation or our age, let's say we, we, we do about four to five museum solo shows a year. It's a lot for an artist that doesn't have 50 people working in the studio, you know? our scale and the reason why now now museums are being more explicit and honest about it is because they're telling us that our work is able to bring in new audiences that normally don't go into mu to our contemporary art spaces so in hanover we they say well maybe you will bring in a turkish speaking audience in philadelphia we would like to bring the russian art community which doesn't often go to art spaces in uh in chicago they say we would like to bring in uh maybe the muslim community so it's now, this doesn't mean these are socioeconomic classes. It's sometimes they're wealthy or not. It's just that the, the bulk, the majority of art experiences or, or the, the art model of exhibition making has been based on a kind of bourgeois. If you, read, if you know the history of exhibition making, it's, a, it's, a, it's based on a kind of uh, boor, uh, basically a kind of a, a, a edification of a bourgeois citizen in early capitalist societies. Germany, France, et cetera, that was then exported elsewhere. Now, this bourgeois museum goer in uh, Bielefeld or in Bremen or in Philadelphia or in New York or in Paris is assumed to have a kind of basic knowledge of culture. Our work is actually totally ignoring that canon of art history and saying, actually, the privileged person, again, is the Polish dentist who might not know anything about art, but knows a hell of a lot about Sarmatism or the Turkish uh, engineer who doesn't necessarily know about 20th century art history, but understands certain questions about Sufism and language politics in the Turkish alphabet. So in some sense, we are privileging a different knowledge base of our audience that's you until now, until recently has been completely dismissed. And now more and more is being, is trying to be targeted because museums are more and more uh, being asked to uh, be held accountable to different and larger publics, right? It's not enough simply to have your largely white Middle, class, middle to upper middle class, to upper class uh, uh, citizens attending. Then you need to be a little bit more <laughs> inclusive. Um, uh, the name of this artist I was mentioning before, uh, Kasha, is Lawrence Abu Hamdan. Uh, you can also look at uh, other artists who I think are very interesting was, uh, I mentioned C.R. Majani. Uh, historically for us, we were big fans of Richard Archwager. Um, but uh, Lydia Uraman is doing really interesting work recently. Uh, uh, How can you make art seem not like art if it's an art gallery white box content? That's tough, of course. Uh, that's much more difficult. One thing we've done also, I would say, I mean, I think there's a lot of, uh, we don't have much time left, but uh, I would like to talk a little bit more about the kind of the tactical, more basic uh, elementary questions. Like for example, to your question, uh, Ali says, uh, we don't, whenever we had a budget, we never went beyond the budget we were given. If that budget was in the beginning was only 200 euros, we only spent 200 euros. One thing we never do is we never try to redo the space, rebuild the space. You really have to work with the space. So. Because uh, otherwise you're you're wasting an enormous amount of your uh, uh, the little budget that you have on uh, trying to make a space something which it is not, and that's always kind of just uh, on principle or spiritually it hurts to spend money on building a lots of huge walls and stuff that are not there that then are not going to exist and they're not your work either. Uh, uh, as you work a lot, Asa mentions with the cross national translation explore contact. What do you think about crossing the species barrier and exploring cross species society? I work mostly with the possibility of wider view than humans. I think this is very interesting, Asa. I can't say, I, I feel uh, I'm only, I feel like a, a, a beginner in that question of cross species. Uh, but I think generally the, the, the move 
in 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 scholarship as well, and recently in academia, uh, this focus on sort of uh, sort of uh, not object oriented ontology, not so much as just generally thinking of a kind of imminence or a consciousness to even non uh, living matter stones. There's been interesting work on rocks, uh, of course, mushrooms recently. I think this is a, a very interesting uh, field and something that I, I read with a lot of interest, but I'm not qualified to, to really work with it uh, yet. I should say that we're not specialists of our region. Of course, you can't be a specialist of such a large region, but we do tend to only focus on read this region or things that we can do research in a language that's the primary or the second language of our region. So it's usually, it's never English, of course, so it's either Polish. We in our In our collective, we speak Polish, Persian, Russian. Uh, I mean, in our, there's of course other languages like German and French, but not necessarily relevant. So we try to make sure that we have at least a, a primary secondary language uh, access to the region, not, and not always in translation, of course, because it just doesn't, there's an under, there's a seems to be a perception that you can do research nowadays remotely through Amazon, ISBN, but you actually need to do, I didn't mention that after we do our two years of scholarly research, we of course go to the region where, where we've, we've been about which we've been reading and, and try to apply that research in a more affective lived way. So we do pilgrimage sites, uh, again, a kind of a, a type of research that's not, that cannot be contained within uh, scholarly text. Um, how do you differ works and issues for publications and exhibitions? That's, uh, I mean, uh, Pickle Politics, for example, is a perfect example. We've created a lot of works. We haven't created a book or a lecture on it yet because it's it's more an affective experience. I don't. I think that, you know, many times people ask us, why do you even start to, uh, uh, why do you, uh, why do you even create artworks? Why create sculptures when you started out as uh, as bookmakers and uh, and you're interested in discourse? Why go into even making exhibitions and sculptures and and why have galleries? And the answer to that is that. I'm a maximalist, we're, we're all maximalists here in Stalin in the sense that if you want to, again, explore other forms of knowledge that are not purely analytical, it's very hard to do that with only words. Books, it's hard to have that kind of affective phenomenological experience purely through text. Uh, it's, it's somehow easier to do that with form materials, non-discursive works actually. Can you tell a bit more about time management, how not to work 24 hours per day while being a young artist and curator? Yeah, it's a hustle. I can't. <laughs> I mean, I, I say that the reason I mention this is that, uh, you know, we have a lot of artists around us who believe that they should be able to live off their work all the time. And, 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 and Kasha and I have always been very clear about the fact that we had jobs all of our lives and we didn't think it was a problem to have another job. Um, if that meant working full time and doing our art work on the weekends, and we did it. If that meant working. I don't know. I, I actually believe the the further away the, the the job is from your actual artwork, then the better. Actually, I don't believe it's in my opinion. To, I can't work when it's too close. So uh, so I was working in fields doing research, as I said, this kind of research, but it was for totally different milieu, uh, not at all cultural uh, policy. I wasn't working in any way linked to cultural policy of governments or of companies at all. Nothing to do with advertising in that sense. Uh, uh, could you recommend books about art or artists which consist a lot of a humor or explore comic phenomenon? Art is a kind of sense of humor, something like that, Magdalena writes. Um, I cannot off the top of my head about art. I can write, I'll tell you a lot about books about comedy uh, and I can happy to share the syllabus with you. I would recommend you write to me at info at and and I'll send you some references. Um, I'm just gonna go through. If according to you, the art should scramble the message, what can you actually gain from it apart from something that might seem meaningless if you don't go into the accompanying research? No, the scrambling is, is a form of translating that research so that something can come out of it, which is a kind of teaser, I don't say teaser, but in some ways, yes, let's say the artworks I'm show, I showed, these, the mirror, the sign, the pickle sign, the sculptures, in some ways they are props, scenography, to, to seduce people to get them to the book. You know, and traditionally in, art, in the art world, kind of the, the, the top of the pyramid is the expensive artwork that the museum and the collector is buying and it's cost, uh, creating it costs thousands of euros and sending it, it's ridiculous. 
And the bottom, of course, of the pyramid is the book. In our, in our hierarchy, the book is at the top. All these pieces that people are commissioning or hopefully buying or collecting or preserving or curating is, is actually a way to get people back to the book in a kind of Abrahamic sense. Uh, um, you consider yourself a research bit artist. What would you advise for artists who work more with their gut feelings and find it hard to actually formulate their message? Do you think that the frustration about describing what's visual is relevant? So, there is a very interesting uh, hadith, a kind of Islam, Muslim idea, which is that is a saying from the prophet that says that uh, blessed are the blessed are the expatriates and those who exile themselves. Now, uh, what it means is that I think it's very important to to understand yourself. So there's a kind of in Western traditions, his, uh, intellectual traditions in psychoanalysis and psychology. There's this idea that you have to really go deep inside yourself, understand who you are, what you mean, what you want to say, all this. I think it's all a load of BS, personally. I think it's actually very important uh, to go very far away from oneself, uh, to understand who one is and what one, want, what one wants to say, what one wants to do. And that is, uh, you find this in, in, in Confucius, you find this in Islam, in Chinese philosophy as well, is that there is no such, th I don't believe there is such a thing as a kind of, unitary singular self. In the same way that I don't believe in this idea of Polishness is one homogenous idea. I think that we have within ourselves, we, are, we should be like empires in the sense that we should have competing factions and competing tribalisms and competing loyalties and competing identities. And the only way we can understand these is actually to go very far away from oneself. For me, that trajectory took me to Russia and to spend a lot, many years in Russia and to understand who I was as an Iranian American. Nobody in my family speaks Russian. Nobody in my family has ever lived in Russia. Russia and Iran, it's a whole other kind of complicated issue. Very few people in Iran speak Russian. Very few people in Russian speak Persian. There was no reason for me to do that, except that it enabled me to give a, a perspective on Iran that most people don't have. Again, if I look at the perspective that most people in the, in the world talking about Iran are Western educated Iranian Americans, Iranian British, Iranian French, talking about the relationship between Iran and the West, blah, blah, blah. I mean, it's great, it's important, Everybody's talking about the same thing. And very few people talk about the relationship of Iran from the perspective of Russia, which of course is ridiculous considering that the Caucasus and Central Asia, parts of it used to belong to the to Persia before they belonged to the Russian empire. Somehow this has kind of been lost in, in 20th century sort of amnesia. So anyway, just that to say that I think it's very important to go very far away from oneself to understand who one is uh, and not, not uh, do so in an insular fashion. Mm. How do you stay in touch with the spiritual, absolute, and playful uh, childish side of life in art, not in the sense of personal spirituality? Uh, Monica asks. I think it's just a way of being. I mean, humor is not just a strategy for us, but I just think it's not worth living life if there was no. I mean, I think it's a, it's a kind of if it's a kind of uh, way of thinking and being is that is not just to make a joke of everything, but to again to kind of take it seriously, but also to take it from behind. Uh, and 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 uh, yeah, it's it's a it's a form of activism, of uh, a kind of lived activism, like daily activism. I think um, I I'm of the school that uh, that it's uh, the joking is a form of resistance. To be perfectly honest, uh, no, I think that's basically it. Uh, I think that's all the questions that I really, I can answer. Um, have you ever felt overwhelmed by the response to your work or growing recognition? No. I mean, uh, it's, it's, no, I, I still, I believe that you know, I, it's 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 you know. There's a very interesting quote which I find very important for as human beings, and it's uh, it's actually a quote by a, a Catholic monk who was an important mid-century figure, kind of best-selling author in the United States. He was the first person to introduce uh, Eastern religions into the Catholic Church, namely Buddhism and uh, Islam. 
his name is Thomas Merton. I'll write his name here. He was an important activist and a, a Trappist monk. Anyway, he, 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 his quote is, quit this world, quit quitting. Sorry, quit this world, quit the next, sorry, and quit quitting. Now, what this means is that uh, basically even the most liberating if you come across something, you decide you devote your life to it, and this is going to get you somewhere in life, even that thing which is enabling you, which is a liberating idea, at some point becomes a prison. So you have to break, again, that thing which you've built. As an artist, I believe that as soon as people start to understand what you're doing, you have to stop doing that. And that's a very difficult thing to do because you've been working in obscurity and you've been trying to get recognition. And as soon as you get recognition, most artists say, okay, now is the time to just hit cruise control, start making a living, enjoying this, and just continue doing what I do. That's wrong, actually. That's kind of, for me, that's death. You, at the very moment when people understand what you're doing, you have to switch tactics and start doing other things, not only for the public, but for yourself, because otherwise it, it will become routine and you, you won't be learning anything. But also because, again, as I said, the, the, if there's, I think, one strength of our work, and it's harder and harder to maintain this strength because as you, is that in the beginning, people didn't know what to do with us. They didn't know, are, you, are, are these people taking the piss? Are they joking? Are they serious? Is the research real? Is it accurate or is it fict fictional? Uh, are they religious and right-wing or are they anti-religious and left-wing? And this not knowing is, is crucial as an art, I believe as an artist, because, and it's more and more difficult to maintain because you start to understand what you, who you are, what you're doing, and the audience starts to understand who you are, what you're doing. And it becomes a bit more routine and formulaic. And then, so it's very important to always be questioning oneself in, in that sense. And for me, the role of an intellectual and artist are not very different. It's just the way the artist expresses that intellectual activity has to be very different from the intellectual. I will end on that, uh, I think, because I think I, I can, uh, as I mentioned, I, have a, uh, I can speak until the, in English they say, until the chickens come home to roost. <laughs>